examiner's office got involved, both to try to figure out who, she, who this person was and what had happened to them to cause them to die. And it took about a week to match up this body with Elizabeth's identity and to determine that this was, in fact, Elizabeth Sullivan. And in the course of that week, the defendant, as scheduled, left San Diego with his daughters, Elizabeth's daughters, and flew to Maryland to be with Ms. Taylor, who had recently had his, their child. So during the course of the autopsy, the medical examiner called in a forensic anthropologist to help determine who the person was and what the cause of death was. And they determined that Elizabeth Sullivan died as a result of a homicide, including sharp forced trauma, which means she was stabbed to death. And they found five different ribs on her left side and on her back that had nicks or cuts in them. One even had a little chip of a bone out of it. And there were holes in the skin that were elliptical, so it was sort of ovals pointing on the ends that matched up with some of those rib injuries, indicative of a sharp object entering her body. And those wounds alone were sufficient to kill Elizabeth Sullivan. Additionally, she had a fracture to her upper jaw, the upper right maxilla, and a little tip of the left nasal bone was missing. Now at the time, the medical examiner, doctor himself, and even since then, was not able to estimate what they call post-mortem interval. That's the time since somebody has died. How long ago did a person die? The forensic anthropologist, based on the way the remains looked at the time and where she was found in San Diego in the general climate here, estimated one to two months. But that didn't take into account any of the specifics of Elizabeth Sullivan's life, when she'd been last seen, when loved ones had last heard from her or talked to her. We will also hear evidence from both the anthropologist and the medical examiner that there are things that can delay decomposition or can interrupt decomposition, including freezing, which is one point I forgot to mention. When the missing persons detectives were investigating the case, they went out to the Sullivan residence the week or two after Elizabeth went missing. And one of them saw a freezer in the garage, sort of a small standalone freezer that was plugged in and was running, but was empty. So now we're back in 2016, and after the body has been identified as Elizabeth's, the detectives get permission to go into the house. The defendant's gone, the military lets them in, and they do a search of the home. And they find some interesting things. In one, one part, they went into the attic of the home. There was actually an attic over what had been the defendant's second floor bedroom before he gave it to his mom. And then there's attic space over the third floor bedroom that had been Elizabeth's. And they're actually all one space up in the attic, but there's access from both bedrooms. So there's sort of a platform over the second floor bedroom, a wall that goes up towards where the third floor bedroom is, and then a small crawl space over the third floor bedroom. And they noticed in that attic that along that wall between the second and third floor attics, where there are vertical two-befores going along the wall, there were some horizontal sort of one-foot-long two-befores. And a couple of those were broken in a downward position. They went into Elizabeth's bedroom and they used luminol, <coughs> which is a substance that reacts in the presence of blood. And because they knew from Ms. Harris that the victim was going to be spending her last night, what turned out to be her last night, in her bedroom, they checked the bedroom with the luminol. And they found that the door, the bathroom from her bedroom, lit up with the luminol on both sides, the side in the bathroom and the side in the bedroom. So they decided to look at the carpet right in front of the bathroom. <coughs> and on the surface, it was dirty, but it didn't have any apparent stains. But they cut back a large section of it. When they peeled it up, there's a large blood stain on the underneath side of the carpet. They looked at the padding below. There was a large blood stain on the top of the padding. So they cut the padding up, and they peeled it up. And on the bottom of the padding, there was a large blood stain down to the wooden subfloor below, where there was still a large blood stain. They checked for DNA on the carpet. 
And sure enough, Elizabeth's DNA was in that blood stain. So they did a pretty thorough search that time. They didn't, however, look under every single piece of insulation in the attic. And there was a lot of insulation, and it was very thick, about six to eight inches thick. So about a year later, they went back to the attic. And all the new people had moved into the residence when they went into the attic. There were no personal belongings up there, no indication that those people had ever been in the attic. And they started looking under every piece of insulation. And what did they find? They found a knife. This knife, to be exact. It was folded up at the time. And it was hidden under the insulation, not far from the access room from what had been the defendant's bedroom. And it looked clean to the eye, but they collected it as evidence. And in the lab, when they looked at it under a microscope, they could see blood in some of the crevices, down where the blade comes out from the handle, the hilt area, and in one of the bolts on the side. And they checked it, and they found Elizabeth's DNA in the blood. Tying a little bit of the defendants, mostly the victims. And on the handle was the defendants and the victims' DNA. Mostly the defendants, some of Elizabeth's. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what brings us here today. This is the evidence that shows you that the defendant is guilty of murder. He had lots of motive. He had the means. He had the opportunity. The crime scene was in her bedroom. The murder weapon was in the attic over his bedroom. You're going to hear from a lot of witnesses. We're going to present this evidence to you. You're going to see a lot of photographs. And once all the evidence is in, you're going to be confident beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant murdered his wife with this knife in their home as their children slept in the bedroom. Thank you. Does the defense wish to make an opening statement at this time? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Maybe I'd be permitted again to move the podium. Sure. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The story of Matthew Sullivan and Elizabeth Sullivan is an American story. It begins in, Min in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where Matthew Sullivan was born, where he grew up, where he went to high school, where he later made the decision to join the United States Navy. He attended boot camp, he went through basic training, and he was eventually assigned to Norfolk, Virginia. While in Norfolk, while tending to his duties during the day, he obtained a residence in Hampton, Virginia, some 15 to 20 minutes away. While he was there, when and off duty, he socialized. He eventually met a young, vivacious woman, a native of Hampton, Virginia, Elizabeth Ricks. Neighborly friendliness progressed into friendship. Friendship progressed into group activities. Group activities progressed into dates. Dates turned into romance, and eventually Matthew and Elizabeth were married. <coughs> Unlike weddings in many American stories, no Sullivans attended the Matthew Elizabeth wedding. No Ricks attended the Matthew Elizabeth wedding.
This was not the first time Elizabeth had made an abrupt change of course in her life. The evidence will show that Elizabeth's family and her friends will report a history of finding a man, finding independence, deciding abruptly to turn the page on her life, and not necessarily sharing with everybody who would otherwise be included normally in such a decision. The marriage progressed quickly. Within two years, two children were born that Matthew and Elizabeth both loved very dearly. And for the first two years, it was a happy marriage. When Matthew was eventually transferred to San Diego for his new naval duties, his duties changed. What had been being stationed in Norfolk and coming home every evening became deployments. Three weeks, six weeks, six months. Matthew was in the South China Seas. Matthew was down by Cape Horn. Matthew was in the Pacific. Matthew was in the Middle East. Understandably, these absences caused the Sullivan marriage to begin to fray. What began as a neighborly romance that became romantic and warm very quickly started to cool. At first, Matthew would come home and notice a little bit of distance, but as military reunions go, eventually they would rekindle. Over time, the rekindling took longer and longer, and it became clear that the marriage was going in the wrong direction. What had been joyous reunions progressed into colder and colder receptions to the point that soon after the birth of their second child, Matthew and Elizabeth ceased having relations. Soon, they were no longer sleeping in the same bedroom. They did obtain military housing in the Liberty Station neighborhood. They did have a beautiful three-story house, not far from the bay, not far from the fields, not far from the naval facilities uh, down in the Point Loma area of San Diego which was convenient because Matthew did not have a driver's license. He was able to take public transportation and attend to all of his duties. But Elizabeth had a void to fill. And the evidence will show that when she fills these voids, whether it be in her life in Virginia, her life in San Diego, and her life beyond, what she would do is first begin with incremental substance abuse. What started out as a glass of wine became bottles of, of whiskey. What started out as marijuana became cocaine. What started out as amphetamine abuse turned into methamphetamine, progressed to fentanyl. Elizabeth's behavior became more and more rapid. Earlier in her life, she was a president of the Latin family area. Elizabeth was a cutter. You will hear evidence from uh, a witness who will describe the implications of cutting and what that's about. Elizabeth was into self mutilation. Friends and family members will describe years of seeing marks up and down her arms, on her legs. On her, on her stomach, self-inflicted wounds that are not disputed. Her father will tell you about this pattern. Her friends will tell you about this pattern. Her friends from Virginia and her friends from San Diego. But Matthew, true to his duties, true to his duty as a father, his duty as a sailor, had no choice but to continue to provide for his family and to serve his country. He knew that Elizabeth was, was not around. 
he knew he would come home from work on days where he thought that child care was, was going to end at such and such an hour and find uh, that, that she was not available. It didn't change his responsibilities, and he took care of his children. The story changed for Matthew dramatically on the, 16th, on the 16th of September, 2014. On that date, Matthew received two incoming messages. One from Elizabeth saying, don't answer unknown numbers. The second was from CPS, Child Protective Services. They had received a complaint. Somebody in Elizabeth's other life had made a report. This person who socialized with Elizabeth and her new romantic interest, Stephen Sutton, noticed that Elizabeth, who would party with them, she could keep up with San Diego, and they, they took their partying seriously. Weeknights, weekends, limo rides around town, excursions away to our families, in and around the area. This friend noticed that she had two car seats in the back of her car, and Elizabeth had not revealed to anyone that she was married. You see, Elizabeth, when the loneliness of the deployments and this transformation started to reoccur in her life, it was 2014. 2014 was a very easy time to have another identity. You will hear evidence that Elizabeth opened multiple uh, email accounts. She had aliases that she would use on the internet. She joined something called the Tinder dating app. You will learn the Tinder dating app is a modern application that with a simple telephone profile in a five minute sign up process, we can be anybody we want. We can change our names, which Elizabeth did. We can put pictures of ourselves in our best lights, which Elizabeth did. We can set a radius of how far or how close we want to find new lovers and partners and friends. Elizabeth did all these things. On some profiles, she would say 10 miles. On some profiles, she would say 50 miles. Sometimes she would give her real name. Sometimes she would, she would make up another name. She existed in this world of technology. <coughs> and it, correspondingly, fit into her plans. This was a time when you didn't need it. Remember, for, for years, there was a, uh, there were taxi cabs, there was driving. But in 2014, there was Uber. No longer did you need to drive your car to and fro in order to get where you needed to be. The evidence will show that Elizabeth and Steve were Uber users. That sometimes they would take Ubers around Steve's neighborhood in Carlsbad. Sometimes they would take Uber rides down in San Diego. Sometimes they would travel around. So what did Matthew do on the 16th of September when he got this information? Well, first, he had to reassure the CPS investigators that, in fact, no, his kids were safe. He was home from work. They were with him. And there was nothing to be concerned about. And a CPS investigation was dropped. These children had a good parent, and it was Matthew Sullivan. There was still a conversation that obviously needed to be had. As counsel said, the jig was up. Yes, they had cooled. Yes, there was distance. Yes, they were sleeping on separate bedrooms, on separate floors. But there was still a lot to discuss. Their lives were intertwined, and a conversation needed to be had. Matthew asked his wife, when can we talk about this? When you get home, I, I, I want to talk about this. On the evening of the 16th, Elizabeth did come home. She didn't stop in the 
foyer and greet the children. She didn't approach Matthew and begin the conversation. She went upstairs to the third floor bedroom where she closed the door. After a respectable interval, Matthew went to the bedroom and knocked on the door. He didn't get a response. He pried the door open and walked in. The scene that he found appalled him, terrified him. Elizabeth had broken a mirror, taken a large shard of glass out of the mirror, and inflicted a deep wound onto her arm. She was bleeding profusely all over the third floor bedroom. Blood on her clothes, blood on the carpet, blood on the furniture. The third floor bedroom looked like a crime scene. Elizabeth, though, had inflicted the wound herself. The evidence will show that Matthew was only five or six hours removed from gaining the knowledge that his wife had been unfaithful, that she was leading a separate life. What did he do when he walked in and found that scene? He could have just turned around and walked away, let Elizabeth, her cutting, her drug-making decision-making, he could have left her, gone back downstairs, woke up in the morning and said, oh, oh my gosh, my wife, she's gone. That's not what he did, though, ladies and gentlemen. The evidence will show that Matthew, as a component of his naval basic training, had learned first aid. He dutifully tied a tourniquet around the arm of the mother of his children. He stopped the bleeding. He did his best to seal the wound. He suggested they call 911. But Elizabeth, already the subject of a CPS investigation, urged him not to. The conversation still needed to be had, but clearly the night of the 16th was not that night. The evidence will show that Steve Sutton, who now had learned that Elizabeth was, uh, was married, apparently appeared to do the right thing. He backed off. They met up briefly, returned some personal items, and after that, all they did was correspond by email. In fact, the evidence will show that on September 23rd, and the morning of the 24th, Steve and Elizabeth had an email conversation. Steve on his account, Elizabeth on one of her many accounts. Steve was reporting that Matthew had been calling him, and he wanted to let her know if it was OK for him to respond. Steve said, I have nothing to hide. I, I didn't know you had this other life. Is it OK if I respond? Elizabeth, the evidence will show in this email, urged him not to, but told him it was up to him. She also expressed relief. She expressed relief that her marriage, quote, was finally over. Matthew and Elizabeth had had the conversation that they needed to have since 2012. And that morning, the morning afterwards, Elizabeth was fine. Steve said, are you in danger? Should I call the cops? Elizabeth said, no, no, I just, I want the drama to all end. We, we've, we, we, we've had our conversation. We've had our peace. She was still absent, though. The evidence will show that despite the conversation that they had on about the 23rd of September, she was still going out. She was still not telling her family where she was going. She was still not attending to her responsibilities to care for their children. The evidence will show that Matthew continued to do what he could to try to balance being a full-time father and a full-time sailor.
but eventually there's just not enough hours in the day. The evidence will show that his command told him to shape up. It was obvious that he was distant and exhausted. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that Matthew did the only thing a responsible parent can do at that time. He called his two little girls' grandmother, his mother, Rochelle, in Minnesota, and told her the situation. Mom, can you come out to San Diego? We've got the bedrooms. It's a large, it's a large military house. You can bring your, your partner. You can bring my sister. But will you please come out here? I have duties to attend to and I need someone to watch my kids. Like any grandmother, Rochelle agreed. Minnesota or San Diego, my grandkids every day, I'm on my way. The evidence is going to show, ladies and gentlemen, that Matthew, sometime around the 8th, 9th, or 10th of October 2014, move forward with that decision to bring out his family. You will see records that show that Matthew contacted <coughs> an airline, purchased three tickets, and made arrangements for an arrival for the 14th of October. He was finally going to put his mind at ease, be able to attend to his duties, and know that his kids were safe. <clears throat> the evidence will show that Elizabeth did not like Rochelle Sullivan. The evidence won't show you, ladies and gentlemen, that there was violence between them. The evidence won't show that, uh, that Rochelle Sullivan ever impersonated her on the internet, threatened her pets, threatened her kids physically harmed her, the things that one would normally associate with a restraining order. The evidence will show that in conversation after conversation with her father, with her friends in San Diego, with her friend in Virginia, that the most important thing for her was that the Sullivans, her in-laws, not move in with them to their, in their house in Liberty Station. But it's California. It's her house. It's his house. <coughs> the evidence will show that on the evening of the 11th of October, Elizabeth went to her friend Nathan's house. The two of them partied. They drank. They consumed methamphetamine. Sometime at the end of that escapade, Elizabeth formed the decision that she was going to try to get a restraining order preventing Rochelle Sullivan and her family from moving into the house. The evidence will show that she did take money from their joint account and give it to a lawyer. The evidence will show that Matthew looked at this, the account statement saw the name of a firm, 2014, gave it at Google, quickly found a number, called, they didn't tell him anything. It will show that he called Steve, who insisted that everything was over and that, and that he, he had moved on. The evidence won't show once that Matt and Sullivan ever threatened Steve or his friends or anybody else while trying to finish his marriage with dignity. The evidence will show that Matthew and Elizabeth had been in counseling, that his Navy service provided him with a free means to process a divorce. The evidence will also show that while he was certainly came into a drained account, that as an active duty service member, he can go to Navy Federal. He can obtain a loan. He did. It processed in 48 hours. Matthew Sullivan was not in financial desperation at the beginning of the week of the 14th. 
the evidence will show that sometime over that weekend, 10, uh, 10 11 of, of October 2014, Elizabeth, despite living in her home, her beautiful three bedroom home, decided instead to go sleep at a homeless shelter. The following morning, she woke up, and you will hear testimony from two off-duty sheriffs who saw her in the park on that Sunday morning, the 11th. She was emaciated. She was disoriented. She was rambling. They didn't administer, they were off duty, they were at their kids' soccer game. They didn't detain her or, or evaluate her for being under the influence. But they did make the same observation. A very scattered, a very lost woman. They both heard her say that she lost her purple, her purple cell phone. Could they help her find it? Dutifully, they looked around. They weren't able to. This was two days before the 13th, or one day before the 13th. Matthew, on the 13th, like any good human, could sense that things were coming to a head. Not having any real articulable way to say that he was being threatened, he did the only thing that a scared person does in those situations. He called 911. The evidence will show that he called the police, and without legal training, he used some inartful words to describe abuse fraud. The evidence will show what he meant was, it sounds like my wife is trying to make a case against me. Can you please come out to the house and mediate? That's what a Minnesota boy does. You're in trouble, you call 911. They asked him during that telephone call, are there any weapons in the house for officer safety? He responded, yes. Do you have any guns? No, I've never owned a gun. We do have some knives, though. What is she wearing? He described her clothing, the last clothing he'd seen her in. A few hours went by, no knock on the door, no call from a patrolman. Matthew made another 911 call. Hey, did you forget about me? My wife is up to something, and I need your help. He's told on the dispatch recording, ladies and gentlemen, that other higher priority calls had come in, and they weren't going to be able to send anybody right then. But if you could please, you know, let us know if, if, anything, if anything gets worse. So, the evening of October 13th, he did what he'd done for months. One day before the arrival of his family, where he doesn't need to do full-time service and full-time parenting, he stayed downstairs with his kids. Elizabeth came home. She went upstairs. She left again and went out. Didn't say where she was going, but by this time, Matthew was used to this. She left her car in the garage. Matthew waited a few hours, and about the same time that Nathan Character started to call her, he started to call her. Matthew called her several times over the night of the 13th. Nathan called and sent some texts. On the 14th, Nathan, in what was his first episode of Elizabeth Disappearing, called 911. Matthew had been here before. Matthew, playing it back in his mind over the course of several months, this wasn't the first time she'd left out saying where she was going. It wasn't the first time she'd been gone overnight. Heck, she just slept in the park 
three nights earlier. Matthew continued to call after the 14th. Call after call after call, ladies and gentlemen. You will see records of his attempts to reach out to her. He called on the 14th. He called on the 15th. He called and texted on the 16th. He called and texted on the 17th. Missing persons report was filed, per Nathan Character's call, and the police showed up. Matthew did what somebody whose mother of their children has left would do. He didn't call a lawyer. He didn't try to hide and say, well, we'll come back with a warrant. He invited detectives to come into his home. Look around. Police obtained bank records. Matthew gave them their bank records. Matthew gave them Elizabeth's cell phone. Matthew answered all their questions. <coughs> Please look around. Any clues you need. Matthew provided his own DNA. He provided his kids' DNA. The passwords that he knew to her accounts, he provided those. He provided their bank records. A little over a month later, Stephen Sutton, who had also been contacted by police, and who had obtained a lawyer, reached out to the police through his lawyer. And in so doing, informed them that he had received an email from somebody he thought was Elizabeth Sullivan. Mind you, the evidence will show that he deleted that email, but his lawyer created the best reconstruction of it that they could. And in that email, Steve asked the obvious question. Hey, everybody says you're missing. Like, what's going on? Is it you? Are you okay? The emailer responded that they were fine. It was a new account that Steve wasn't familiar with, but it had the names and the general bearing that Elizabeth's other accounts had had. Still unbelieving, Steve sent a confirmation. He said, hey, do you remember that time when we had this adventure, that adventure? What was the trinket on the keychain for the jacuzzi? Something only somebody who had been in that experience, on that affair, in that adventure could know. The emailer responded with the correct answer. Something only Stephen Sutton and Elizabeth Sullivan could have known. Weeks turned into months. The investigation continued. Police contacted Matthew Sullivan. Hey, will you come down for another interview? Absolutely. I'm on duty till 4, I don't have a driver's license, don't worry, we'll pick you up. Okay. Pick me up at the, at the Balboa Naval Hospital, I get off at 4 o'clock. Officers went there and transported Matthew Sullivan to, his, uh, to, to the station where he submitted to another round of questioning. Never asked for a lawyer, answered everything, that, everything they wanted, didn't conceal anything. Can I get you more records? What do you need? The evidence will show that at no point in this investigation did Matthew ever not completely accede to the officer's request to help them in the search. A few more weeks go by into 2015, and they interview him again. At the conclusion of each of these interviews, <coughs> After allowing the police to answer, after answering the police's exhaustive questions, Matthew Sullivan was released again and again. The evidence will show that after about 30 days after her disappearance, he did stop calling. Right about the same time, he unfriended everyone from that part of 
his life and Elizabeth's life from Facebook. He found a new romance. Eventually, his parents moved home, or his mother and her partner and his sister moved home. His, uh, he moved in with a girlfriend. They eventually had a child. But with all of those roommates, over all of those months, Matthew would leave for eight hours a day to tend to his duties and would leave them with free reign of the house. He never said, oh, don't go in the garage, stay out of my room. Hey, enjoy the grandkids, have a good time. You're not going to hear one bit of evidence of Matthew Sullivan trying to secret away parts of his home. When Elizabeth's body was found, there was a medical examination. There was a toxicology inspection. Elizabeth was found in her system with amphetamines, with methamphetamine, with fentanyl, with marijuana. She was found about 200 yards from the park that we know that she slept in on nights when she would not be at home. You will hear evidence of Elizabeth having access to money. You will hear evidence of Elizabeth knowing how to get phones, burner phones, they call them. The evidence will show that Elizabeth Sullivan did not die of natural causes. <coughs> but the evidence, ladies and gentlemen, is not going to show you anything that is inconsistent with a cutter married to a Navy man who had a secret life, who had a history of, of behavior that was erratic, and who had a history of leaving. At the conclusion of eight years, Matthew was awarded the Navy Medal of Freedom, the Global Terrorism Cross, the Navy Good Conduct Medal, and the Humanitarian Service Medal. He was honorably discharged and moved with his family, or with, with, his, with his new uh, with his new love to the East Coast. The evidence will also show that five days after Elizabeth's disappearance, Matthew did the responsible thing. He went to a local gun store, he submitted to a background check, he put down a deposit, and he purchased a pistol. He purchased a safety lock. He purchased a storage box. The evidence will show, ladies and gentlemen, that Matthew made this purchase of this firearm because he didn't know what was coming next. All he knew was that she had friends in another life and that she was gone and that she wanted them out of the house. He did the responsible thing. Later, in Maryland, San Diego police officers came out another time. They conducted another search, this time of his, of, his, uh, of his Maryland home, of his Maryland storage unit. Matthew was no longer keeping the gun with him. He was now 3,000 miles away from whatever threat he perceived in October 2014. He was storing the gun, safely locked away in a storage unit 15 miles from his home. He didn't need it anymore. They said, we cannot force you to talk to us, but we have more questions about Elizabeth. Okay, where do you want to go? 
he submitted to yet another interview. After that exhaustive interview, Matthew was released without arrest again. It was not until the search that revealed the knife in the exhibit, a knife that the evidence will show was part of Matthew's naval service. Matthew worked in procurement. He's not a SEAL. He's not an aviator. He's never engaged the enemy. Matthew's the guy on the ship when it's time to get new furniture, to stock the, 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 the supply closet. He's one of the guys <coughs> out there all day with knives, opening boxes, doing procurement. The same service that he performed at the Naval Hospital. You are not going to see one piece of evidence in this case, ladies and gentlemen, that is inconsistent with the idea of a cutter married to a naval man who had a secret life and who made erratic decisions. And at the end of the day, when the evidence is all put through, after several witnesses, it will not be able to divert your attention from the fact that the evidence is consistent with the life that Elizabeth Sullivan had led to that point, and that while her passing, while tragic, cannot be attributed to Matthew Sullivan. And at that point, I will expect you to find him not guilty. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. We'll take a brief recess. Please keep in mind my prior admonition. Don't discuss the case with anyone or form or express any opinion until the case is finally submitted to you. We'll take about 10 minute recess.
Virginia? Yes, she did. Did she attend college there? Yes, she attended at Hampton University. Did she complete it or did she stop after a while? She stopped after her second semester sophomore year. And did she work there after that? Yes, she did for a brief period. And when Elizabeth was growing up, were you and her mother married? Yes, yes. Um, at some point, did you and her mother divorce? Yes, we did. Approximately when was that? We divorced in 07. And prior to that time, I assume Elizabeth had lived with you and her mother? Yes, ma'am. And then after you divorced, who did Elizabeth live with? She lived with me. And how, so what age did she live with you? Uh, she moved out in 09, so she was, I don't know, 20, do the math, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> but she was in her 20s? Yes, yes, late 20s. Um, and was that while she was going to the university, or was it after she was finished with that? She, had, she had finished with that. Okay. And did Elizabeth have any particular interests or hobbies that you were aware of? Dance. Dance. What type of dance? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, creative dance, ballet. She's a little cow. Did she do that um, both in childhood and as a young adult? Yes, ma'am. Did you call her Elizabeth or Liz, or did you have another nickname for her? Called her Elizabeth. Called her Liz. Called her Betty. Did you ever meet Matthew Sullivan before she married him? No, ma'am. How long was it after their marriage that, before you met Matthew Sullivan? I would say maybe, you know, if I had been born, I'm guessing about three, four years. I believe you said Ryan had been born, is that correct? Oh, yes. Yes, is, sir. Is Ryan one of your grandchildren? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, yes. That's okay. Um, and when was Ryan born? Ryan was born in 2010. In September of 2010? In September 2010. And is Ryan a girl or a boy? Girl. Um, did you know that Elizabeth was dating Matthew before they got married? No. And did you attend the wedding? No. I guess not if you hadn't met him yet. Mm. How long after the wedding did you learn that they got married? If you know. I don't know. I don't know when they got married. She told me she was married. All right. And do you see Matthew Sullivan here in court? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me where he's sitting and describe something he's wearing, please? He's wearing a blue shirt and a blue and white polka dot necktie. The record reflect the witnesses identify the defendant. Yes. Do you recall Elizabeth and Matthew moving to San Diego? Yes, ma'am. And do you know approximately when that was? Uh, I would say probably, I'm guessing. My memory's not serving me too well on that one. I would say maybe around 2010. Was it before Ryan was born? Mm, yes, it was before Ryan was born. Okay. And then did, did Matthew and Elizabeth have any other children? Yes, ma'am. When was their other child? Was it just one other child? Just one. And boy or girl? Girl. When was she born? Uh, she was born May 30. The end of May, uh, 2012. Right. And did you get to see uh, the second child? Is her name Greer? Yes, yes. Did you get to meet her as a baby? I did. I did. What were the circumstances of that? <coughs> My son and I went up to visit them for Christmas, Christmas of 2012. Okay. And did Elizabeth's mother pass away in 2012? Yes. 
did Elizabeth get to see her before she passed? Yes, she did. Can you just briefly tell us the circumstances of Elizabeth getting to see her mother before she passed? As a matter of fact, I stand corrected. That was when I first met Greer, because right after she was born two weeks, and my wife passed away like two weeks after she was born. Elizabeth flew in and brought Greer with her and brought her into the uh, the unit, the critical uh, ICU unit, and uh, we snuck her in. Snuck Greer in? Yes. So that Elizabeth's mom could be paid? Yes. And was it shortly after that that her mother passed? Yes, ma'am. Was her mother's passing hard on Elizabeth? Yes, it was. I imagine it was hard on you, too, even though you were divorced? Yes, ma'am. Were you and Elizabeth close um, as a daughter? I'd like to think so, yes. Were you, did you communicate with her? say you were close with her during this time of her mother's passing? Yes, we, we, we talked a, a lot. Did that talk continue up through 2015? The communication with your daughter? Well, I, I would say yes. We, we remained, we talked a lot on the phone, at least once a, once a day, maybe once or twice every other day. But we, we talked. And uh, when is the last time you got to see your daughter? would be when she came home from my mother's death, right after my mother died. And when was that? That was in August of 2014. All right. Um, was it August, do you recall the date that your mother passed? Uh, like August 22nd, something like that. Was Elizabeth home prior to your mother's passing, or was it after she passed? No, she got the phone call that, that uh, my mother had passed, and the court of plane came on out. And when you saw Elizabeth during that visit, um, how did she look to you? She was, she lost a, a great deal of weight, and uh, to the point where it concerned me a little bit. Approximately how long um, did Elizabeth stay in Virginia after your mother's passing? Two, three days. And after, she, did she return to San Diego, California, from Virginia then? Yes, ma'am. And after that, did you maintain communication with Elizabeth? Sure did, yes. <clears throat> Did you learn from her about uh, whether her in-laws were planning to move in to her home with Matthew here in San Diego? She shared briefly a little bit of information about that, yes, but I didn't know. Was I'm sorry. I didn't know of their intention to, to move. Yeah. Was Elizabeth happy about that fact? No, not at all. And are you aware of any steps she took to stop that from happening? I'm more aware of what she planned to do. Okay. Did she tell you what her plans were? Her plan was she wanted to seek legal action. Yeah, I think we we asked specifically. Did you talk with her on the phone She was indeed, I'm sorry, she was indeed looking into uh, seeking legal action uh, or restraining what I think it was, I'm not sure, but to keep them from being able to move in to that home. She wanted to block that. And approximately what time of day did you have this conversation with your daughter? I was at a PTA meeting, so it was in the evening. It was about uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock uh, Eastern time. Okay. Um, and was it difficult for you to talk with Elizabeth at that time since you were at a PTA meeting? 
Yeah, we had, had to go back and forth, and finally I had to excuse myself and go to a more private setting so I could have a conversation with her. And were you able to have a conversation with her in a more private setting? A brief conversation, yes. Oh. But I was able to talk to her. And what was your understanding about where Elizabeth intended, or where she planned to go uh, that evening? She shared with me, or we discussed, the the fact she would be going home, and I was concerned about that. Are you sure, I remember my exact question, are you sure you want to go back to that house tonight? Why were you worried about that? Well, she had, she had shared with me her concerns about uh, Matt's behavior, and she felt threatened by his behavior. She was, she was afraid of him. But did she still intend to go as far as you understood? She was going to go back home that night. We didn't reach closure on that conversation, but my, my understanding was that I was assuming that she was going to do that because she ended it with, I can't talk right now. Because <coughs> something had come up. And do you know... The police department, is that noise? I'm not getting some vibration or noise. You want to hear that? Do you know where Liz, what Elizabeth was when you had that conversation with her? She shared with me that she was, had just left the lawyer's office, the attorney's office. And what was her demeanor like when she spoke with you? Nervous, excited. Uh, I could sense a, an apprehension and a, and a nervousness about it. this. Was these were big steps she was she was taking she was taking these big death steps, but she was nervous about. It. Did you ever talk with your daughter again after that conversation? you learn that she had been reported as a missing person to police? Yes, ma'am. How did you learn that? Uh, a detective hunter, I believe, called and informed me that she had been listed as a missing person. Did her husband call you to tell you that she was missing? No. Once you learned that police had been alerted that she was considered missing, what did you do, if anything, to try to reach out to her, or try to find her? Oh, uh, I was texting, 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 calling, texting, and uh, reaching out to family and, and <clears throat> trying to find some sort of support and what should I do. I was, I was, it, was just, it was a very confusing point. It was very, I was panicking. Gone. I didn't know where to find her. Did you um, hire a private investigator or do anything along those lines? I did. Why did you do that? I wanted to find my daughter. I wanted to find anything. Did you come to San Diego to look for her? Or I did. I did. Approximately, when did you do that? I came out here on the 6th of November. Of 2014? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And I don't know if I was clear, but the conversation you spoke about earlier with Elizabeth uh, about the restraining order, was that on October 13th of 2014? Yes, ma'am. That was October 13th, 2014. When you came out to San Diego, uh, <coughs> we, I, uh, I interviewed with a, a news team. 
a little loose channel here. I visited their home. They being? Uh, Matt and Elizabeth, and visited with my granddaughters. We had grown, uh, visited with my granddaughters. And we had dinner, we went shopping to get some toys for the girls, and met his mother and sister and his um, mother's friend. Referring to Matthew's mother and sister? Yes. And did you go into the home? I uh, did. Did you have any desire to see Elizabeth's room or Elizabeth's things or anything like that? Yes, I, I wanted to, to see her room. Were you allowed to do so? I was taken upstairs and the door was open. I peeked inside. I could, it was a quick glimpse. The door was closed. Did you get to go in the room? No, no. Uh, do you know why you didn't get to go in the room? No. And did you ask if you could? I expressed an interest and said I would I'd like to, and it was gestured, as I recall. And uh, I can remember walking up the hallway, okay? It was kind of awkward, it was a little tense, it was a tense environment. But I can remember walking up the hallway and walking to the door. And I fully expected since we had done that that I'd be going in. But body placement, the doors opened. And it was a good event. I felt awkward about trying to walk by him or get into it in. And he closed the door quickly. So Matthew was between you and- And the, my ability to get inside. Then he closed the door, so just backed off. Did that seem normal to you, or strike you as unusual, or anything like that? No, it struck me as unusual. Did you um, visit with Matthew and your granddaughters further in your stay in San Diego, or was it the only time you visited with them? No, we visited that first night. We all did, that's when the news crew came out. We concluded the interview. And uh, we had made plans to get together the following day. Uh, my niece came out with me. And we had made plans to, to visit with them the following day. And we talked, my niece and I talked. And it was just a little, it was just strange vibe that we just decided, you know what, no, we're not going back. So we didn't go back to the house. When you talked to the news, uh, did Matthew also talk with the news, or was it just you? No, he was present. He, he came out. It was right in front of their home. It was a little park or something right there in front of the home. And uh, he came out there with, it was my niece, myself, and Matt. And uh, he stood by while the uh, reporter interviewed me, and I do believe she asked him to talk to him, and he declined. Uh, prior to going to visit the home on this occasion, meaning your trip out here on November mm -hmm. 6th, well, were you aware that Elizabeth and the defendant slept in different bedrooms? No. Did you learn that on this visit? Uh, I can't recall. So. But I didn't know at one point. I'm just trying to remember when I found out. Sorry. That's okay. I'm just wondering if when you went to look at her bedroom, <clears throat> excuse me, if you thought you were looking at her bedroom alone or their bedroom. You talk my memory. I knew when I looked at that bedroom, it was her bedroom. I see. <coughs> Sorry. No, that's all right. Did Matthew give you any of Elizabeth's belongings? Yes. Uh, he said she had two cell phones, two old cell phones, and asked me what I would like to have. And I said, yes, I would. Gave Did he offer you anything else at first? No, he did not. Had you ever met uh, his mother or her partner or his 
his sister before this visit? No, ma'am. And Mr. Ricks, I'm going to ask you to take a look at a photograph. It's going to be on the television in just a moment, a big screen. Can you identify, this is People's Exhibit 4, can you identify uh, what's shown in this photo? That's my daughter Elizabeth, my oldest grandchild, her daughter, Ryan. And then I'm going to ask you to take a look at People's Exhibit 5. If we can relax just a little bit, please. Can you identify what's shown in this photograph? Elizabeth. And is this approximately how she looked the last time you saw her in August of 2014? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I have no more questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Foundation. <clears throat> yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Do you understand what my job is here today? Uh, yes, sir, you're the defense attorney. And you understand that I'm required to ask you questions, um, and in no way do I want to diminish your loss. I understand. As a preliminary matter, after my condolences, as a preliminary matter, uh, did you and I have a conversation a little over a year ago? Like by telephone? I don't recall. Do you recall uh, receiving a call from a 619 number, someone identifying themselves as one of Matt's representatives, uh, inquiring about uh, adoption proceedings in Virginia for those kids? Objection relevance. Sorry, I know. So, to the best of your knowledge, this is the first time we have spoken. Yes, sir. Your daughter Elizabeth. You testified earlier that she was a dancer. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that she lived uh, with you and your and your wife uh, for many years, uh, up until the time of you and your wife's separation? True, yes. And then uh, at some point, uh, two of your, two of her relatives, uh, her grandmother and her mother passed away, is that correct? Yes. Uh, who, who passed first? Uh, her grandmother. I'm sorry, her mother. I'm sorry, her mother passed in 2012, and her grandmother passed in 2014. When Liz's mother passed in 2012, did, uh, did Liz get an inheritance? Yes, she did. Did she inherit about $50,000 from her, from her mother's passing? Yes, she did. Elizabeth, uh, save that money? I uh, don't know. In growing up, in watching Elizabeth grow up, uh, would you say that she, she was bad with money? I would say she might not have always spent it the way I would wanted her to have spent it, but she always managed to have her own. And when you say half her own, did she like the good things in life? Mm. Mm. Like as we all would. She liked, she liked to dress nice and, and present herself, huh? 
to jump away. And we saw from the photo she had fashion sense? I think so, yes. She kissed a lot like her dad. <laughs> Was there anything going on uh, between you and your daughter in 2010? Was there some sort of rupture in the relationship? Not that I'm aware of. Did you find it unusual that she would uh, she would marry someone without letting you know? No. You did not find that unusual? Is that a no, sir? That's no. And, and just for the record, uh, the court reporter has to take down our words, so uh, verbal responses are, are, are best. Does that make sense? Indeed. So, so that, 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 was, that was not telling you that she was getting married. It did not strike you as out of the ordinary for Elizabeth's uh, behavior. No. And you were getting along fine in 2010. Sure, I'd say yes. Um, wh why is it that if you were getting along well in 2010, that uh, it didn't surprise you that she would take such a large step as marriage uh, without informing you first? Elizabeth was very independent and very private. And was that a trait that she had her whole, her whole time growing up or something she developed? I would say from, from a young age, an early age, say uh, puberty, from adolescence, she was a, she tended to be kind of private. How did you learn that she'd been married? She told me. Excuse me. Yes, sir. She told me. Were you aware of your daughter's drug use back in Virginia? Yes. Were you aware that she did, did some marijuana? I would have to say that was an assumption that I made. I did not know any uh, substance of choice that she used. I just knew that she was using. Is it true, though, that you told police that you thought she was using marijuana and cooking? I, as I said, my assumption. Right. And assumptions are always based on our experiences. Is that right? No one could argue that point. Uh, what, what led you to the assumption that she was using marijuana and cocaine? Uh, say late hours, uh, being the morning after, seeing her kind of sluggish, things like that. But then as young people can be, I'm, I'm assuming it's just a young person that is trying to do you party. Did Elizabeth like the party? No, I wouldn't say any more so than anyone else her age. But she drank alcohol. Yes, sorry. And, <coughs> I understand it's a process and this is obviously difficult. And we, I would say and, and Thank you. You have, Thank you. A, you have a heart and I understand that we both have to continue. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Elizabeth's independence, did it ever, is it true that it sometimes led to her taking off for a few days at a time? Did you ever lose track of your daughter's whereabouts back in Virginia? Has there been a time in, in, in your relationship with Elizabeth that you didn't know where she was? In her life in Virginia. Until Vegas, but then you're Vegas the time. In the years 2008 through 2009, did Elizabeth uh, disappear ever? I'm, con uh, I'm really confused as to what you mean by disappear. Were there times where you did not know where she was? For, for days or. Uh, no, not for days, no. Over what period of time would you not know where she was? I would say if she were, would leave the house to go to a party, 
Okay, and not, and come home late, or we might go off into the next day. Then I might not know exactly where she is, but I knew her friends and a general, just like any other teenager or young adult, they want their privacy, so I would give her that, that room. But as far as me making a statement that sounds like she disappeared on me, I don't know where she was. No, I never had that feeling. Did she ever, uh, she, she never left town and, and came back and said that she had a, had a romance? She never, she never told you that? No. She never made a new group of friends and, and wouldn't be seen for a few days? Now that I recall. Do you recall an incident where you went to your bank account and realized that Elizabeth had, had removed the money from it? Yes. Approximately what year was that? I'm thinking maybe 2001. 2000, maybe 2002. Okay, so somewhere right around her 18th birthday, early, early adult. Right, right. And did you guys have a joint account? No. Do you know how Elizabeth gave access to your, to your funds? She actually relevance. Oh. Uh, no, I don't, I don't know, no. Do you recall approximately how much she took? Six hundred dollars. <coughs> and those funds have been in a bank somewhere? I mean, you, you had a bank account, that, that's where they were? Right. It, it wasn't a credit card account? No. Had you ever given her a, a debit card for that account? No. Had you ever let her have check writing privileges on the account? I may have. I don't know. I don't remember. Prior to taking the money, it's true though that she didn't she didn't ask you first? No, she did not. Did you ever find out what she spent it on? She paid a uh, overdue phone bill. So she brought her cell phone bill up and she didn't have the money herself. So she, she got access to yours? Correct. And you know if she did that online or if she went to the bank? I have no idea. All you knew was the money was gone? Right. When it came to Elizabeth's temperament, she could get pretty fired up, couldn't she? Pretty excited? She was, she was excitable? Uh, it's from time to time, right. Would <coughs> she be confrontational? I wouldn't call it confrontational. That, that implies almost to, to a degree of violence. I wouldn't say confrontational. She would be assertive in, in arguing her point. She was good at arguing her point. Did you know her to work in those days, back in 2008, 2009? I'm sorry? Which was she employed in those days? Yes. What kind of work did she do? She would, uh, she worked on Hampton University's campus uh, in several capacities, a secretary, a uh, receptionist. She worked <coughs> with a, uh, A remodeling company, but windows selling windows, things like that. That's about all I can recall.
Did either your wife or your mother have a bolo? My wife had a bolo. And that's a European automobile? Right. It's about a 2012 model? Mm, no, that Volvo was a 2008. But it was a luxury car? Yes. It was a late model for the day, for its day. Sure. And when she passed away, uh, is it true that she left that Volvo to, to Elizabeth? Yes. And is it true that Sometime in 2014, Elizabeth asked you to ship that Volvo from Virginia to San Diego. 2012. She did ask me to ship that Volvo to San Diego. And do you recall telling officers that you discussed that Volvo with her in 2014? You'd have to help refresh my memory. Do you recall uh, something called CarMax? You know what CarMax is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what is CarMax? It's a retail outlet to sell cars. Do you recall a conversation with Elizabeth in 2014 involving CarMax? Yes. Can, can you tell the jury uh, what was the nature of that conversation? It was uh, she wanted to sell the car wholesale to CarMax. And that was sometime near the time of her disappearance? I'll rephrase. I'm sorry? I'll rephrase. Do you remember telling officers that you had a conversation with your daughter about the Volvo, about selling it wholesale on CarMax, right. sometime near her disappearance? I remember having a conversation with her about selling the car to CarMax. Uh, wholesale, but I don't recall the the relation the project of, of the date, how close it was to her disappearance. I'm trying to search my memory. I'm thinking it was closer to say the springtime of 2014, if that's close as as, as you were saying, but sometime like the springtime of 2014, like April, May. And did you ever see if the purchase was completed? Did you ever, did you ever get a digital record of, of the purchase being, being done? No, no, it wasn't my car. I just advised her on what she could do to sell it. And did she ever tell you that the sale was done? Yes, yes. And do you, do you remember about how much, how much cash she was able to get for that? No. Do you remember describing your daughter to police as uh, provocative and manipulative? Uh, I, may, I may have used those words. And what about your experience with Elizabeth? What caused you to describe her as provocative and manipulative? In a father-daughter relationship? Yes, sir. She was, she knew how to use daddy to get what she needed, to whatever she wanted me to do for her, whether she had to provoke me into doing something or argue her point, but uh, in that way, she, would, she could manipulate me into helping her as she needed me to help her. And there were often times in your relationship when she needed your help, is that true? Yes, sir. Uh, from a financial perspective? I'd say no more than any other child sometimes needs their parents. Right. But, yeah. but, but into her adulthood, you were still, from time to time, providing financial support? Yes. Happy to do so. Yes, sir. Matt Sullivan, that you were coming to, to San Diego after Liz disappeared? Was it, was it a, was a tough situation where you, you showed up in, in San Diego and knocked on the door? Oh, no, no. No, that, that's not going to be my style. I don't do it. No, I, was, I, I didn't know I was coming out. 
Yeah, that's not the Virginia way. We don't just knock on people's doors and show them. Thank you. Yes, sir. I want to give you that word. Outstanding. And um, so you, you reached out by telephone and said, hey, uh, obviously there's, there's some family stuff that needs to be investigated and discussed. Uh, me and some kin are going to come your way. Yes, sir. And, and when you did so, um, did Matthew attempt any way to prevent you guys from coming out? Not that I recall, no. When you got into town, uh, did you have any trouble making contact? No. And were they still living in the same place that you, that you that they lived when you uh, when you come out for Christmas before? Or no, they, no, they had moved. They had moved from a rental into military housing. And Matthew provided you with that address. Yes. And at the time that it was arranged for you to come by, uh, Matthew uh, was there when he said he would be? Uh, you know, you really asking me to search my memory. As I recall, this is a minor point, but as, I do, as I'm thinking, I don't think he was there when we first got there. It was simply a thing where he was at work and he was going to arrive shortly. And then he did so. What kind of work was Matthew doing in those days? Naval. He was an enlisted Navy man. All right. So you would, uh, okay. And when you arrived, did you, did you meet uh, Rochelle Sullivan, or did you meet up with Rochelle Sullivan, his, his mother? His mother, yes. And Trudy Larson, his, uh, his mother's partner? Yes. And uh, Shannon Sullivan, his, his adult age sister? Yes. Are you able in your mind's eye to describe yourself, Sullivan, uh, for the jury? Uh, so you can object to Sullivan, Your question is, are you asking for physical description? Yes, sure. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, of course. Um, Approximately how old is Rochelle Sullivan to be? I'm very poor at that. Uh, I would say in her uh, late 50s, early 60s, I remember she had a short haircut. Would you describe her as, as strong or frail, or how, how would you describe her physical frame? Uh, a sturdy build. Does she appear to be in good health? Oh, uh, I wouldn't. I don't even know how to. I mean, she didn't appear to be in any pain. Okay, but she was she was mobile. She could walk around. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the same with uh, Ms. Larson. Just a. Uh, I gotta tell you, I have vague memories of her. I can remember her being on a couch. Uh, I have a very vague memory of her. Okay. And what about Shannon? You have any memory of her? Physically, what you That's at? the sister? Yes, sir. I remember she had straight, black, long hair. That was it. Do you remember describing her as, to the police as gothic? As you say, uh, and I'm looking at I'm remembering her. Yes, sir. That would sound like something I might use to describe her, yes. Yeah. Dark hair, dark fingernails, dark makeup. Oh, yeah. That's what, in terms of timing, It is, Your Honor. Thank you for asking. Okay, so we'll take a recess and continue after the lunch break. Please keep in mind my prior admonition. Don't discuss the case with anyone or form or express any opinion until the case is finally submitted to you. We'll resume at 1.30 after the lunch.
put it off for some reason. They fixed it, I think. And then they were like, it's supposed to be June of this year. Wine, but back to the They may have moved it to okay. September. I'm not exactly yeah, it's sure. Just, yeah. Oh, I believe you. Yeah. So you have so a, the first one, one up there. Yeah, that's the first one. So you, you have one on the yeah, yes. one on the witness stand. Okay. And if, and if you guys have an issue, you can come and help us. Like, we're not yeah. Good. yeah. That's okay. Cool. So cool. Yeah. And we adjusted the um the white balance. <laughs>
Norfolk in a continental. Okay. And that's down by the Navy base? Yeah, yeah. Everything and in Norfolk is near the Navy, Navy base. Yes, sir. Right. And that's approximately, what, 25 minutes or so from your, uh, your home in Hampton? Yes. And did you guys have a conversation on the drive back in? Yes, I'm sure we did, yes. And at that point, it's true that you had not yet set the date for your mother's services. Right. Um, that that date was set, uh, was, set, was set later, is that correct? That's correct. And it was your understanding that it was Elizabeth's intention uh, to remain in town uh, throughout the period of that, uh, that, that those, those services? No. It was not a mission to stay for the services? That was not my understanding. Okay. Um, is it true that while she was in town, um, she asked you to, uh, to, to take her somewhere uh, up to Northern Virginia? Yes. And that was within a, 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 within a day of her arriving, is that correct? Correct. Uh, she had a cousin or some other family up there? Well, my mother passed in Northern Virginia, so that's where we were going. Okay. The services were intended to be held in Northern Virginia? No, the services had not been had not had not been determined yet. They were yet to be determined. She had just passed. Elizabeth flew in. And do you call the exact date of her passing? I think it was August twenty second. I might be off on the date. Alright. So you think it was after Elizabeth's birthday of August fourteenth? Oh yeah, yes. At some point during that trip, though, did you take her to Northern Virginia and then leave her there and then return back to, to Hampton yourself? Yes, I did. And is it true that after about a day of being up there, uh, she called you and asked you to come back and get her again? Yes. And did she seem that she was in an emotional state when she, when she made that call? No, she called and asked me to come and get her, so that's what I did. While you were there, is it true that, that she did not go into much detail about the quality of her marriage? Well, uh, I'm not. Well, while, you were, while you were visiting with her on the drive from Hampton to, Virgin to Northern Virginia, uh, is it true that she did not go into much detail about the, about the situation in her marriage? No, she did not. And you did not learn in that conversation that she was sleeping in separate bedrooms? I don't recall, to be honest with you. Did you learn um, at that time, is it true that you, you did not learn that she was having uh, an affair uh, with, with somebody else uh, within her marriage during that time? No. That, 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 that subject was, was not part of your father-daughter conversation? Not that I recall. When the services were eventually scheduled, it's true that Elizabeth had already returned back to San Diego, is that right? Yes. Now, when you reached out to her uh, during the course of the month of October of 2014, uh, you testified that you guys were having conversations um, about once a day, once every couple of days? Yes. And at that time, did you note any change in, in her emotional bearing? No, I didn't notice any change, no. All right, she didn't seem more frantic? Not that I recall. She didn't seem like she was raising her voice uh, more often than, than you were accustomed? Toward me? No, no. Did you hear her raising her voice towards the other, did any topics uh, seem to bring out emotion in her at that time? Not that I recall. Now, when you spoke to her, um, first by, by text and then by telephone, on the evening, your evening, in Virginia time, um, October 13th, do you recall testifying about that conversation? Do I recall testifying about it? Yes, sir. Yes. And during that conversation, uh, she was, it's, it's true that you guys were discussing uh, what her future plans were as it related to her marriage. Her future plans as it related to her marriage, I'm not sure I understand you. Did she tell you that she was getting a lawyer? Yes. Okay. And she told you that she was looking to get a restraining order to keep Rochelle Sullivan and uh, Matt's in-laws from, from moving in with them? Yes. Um, is it true that you, uh, you have no information that Rochelle Sullivan ever assaulted uh, your daughter? 
No. Matt's mother? No. And Trudy Larson never assaulted your, your daughter? Protection calls for speculation. Did you harbor any fear that uh, your daughter would have any harm befall her uh, by the arrival of, uh, of uh, Matthew's mother? Physical harm you're, you're speaking of? Yes. No, I can't say that I did. And in, in meeting Elizabeth, uh, meeting Rochelle Sullivan at a later date, um, she did not strike you as somebody by her demeanor uh, who was uh, somebody who would inflict physical harm on a, on a person. Objection calls for speculation. Was Rochelle Sullivan, uh, was she physically, was, was she aggressive towards you while you were there? No. Did she raise her voice? No. Did she do anything overtly to make you feel unwelcome? No. Uh, when you were there, she prepared food for you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She did prepare food for you? Yes. We all, we all worked together preparing a meal together. Okay, so it was, it was you and some of the older, some of the, some of Matt's parents in the kitchen just putting a meal together as part of the, part of commuting during this, during this process. Is that true? Yes. Is, is it also true that during this process that you uh, had a chance to interact with your grandkids? Yes. And uh, they seem to be, to be healthy? Yes. Protection relevance. Sustain. Move to strike. Brand. You testified that Matthew uh, gave you a couple of cell phones that belonged to Elizabeth? Yes. And those cell phones that he gave you, um, uh, were, they, were they working or were they older? What was, what was their status? Older and not working. Was there any property of, of, of Elizabeth that, that you that specifically asked Matthew for that he, he refused to give you? No. While you were there, is it also true that uh, at one point you and uh, your daughter went off to go shopping at Target? No, you and your, your niece, excuse me? Yes. And uh, at that time you, you drove the, the black Prius that uh, was in the Sullivan's garage? Yes. And uh, that was the car that had been uh, previously owned and driven by, uh, by Elizabeth at that time, is that true? True. And, uh, Matthew was, as Elizabeth's uh, spouse, was, was also the owner of the vehicle? I don't, I don't know if he was owner, I don't know how that was set up, I don't know. Did Matthew provide you a set of keys to drive it? Yes. And certainly did not try to impede you from doing it when he found out he needed to do some errands? No. In the course of uh, seeing your daughter in August of 2014, did you have occasion to see if there were any uh, injuries to her, uh, to, to her body? No, I did not. Did you happen to see if there were any marks on her legs? No, I did not. Did you happen to see if there were any marks on her arms? No, I did not. I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure the record's gonna be clear if those are answers that observed and saw no injury or he didn't have an opportunity to observe. That's what I'm talking about. I don't know that the answer is clear. Uh, did you have a chance to see your daughter's bare arms uh, during the visit? If you recall? Uh, I'm sure I did. I mean, I, I, I don't re specifically recall saying looking at her arms, and, but I'm sure I did. Yeah, I mean, it, it's five years ago. but. Uh, but but she, she in, to your knowledge, she wasn't going out of any lengths to, to conceal any parts of herself. No, no. And she slept at, at your home while she was in town? When she was in Hampton? Mm -hmm. Yes. And how many total days, if you recall, did she stay in Virginia while she was there? I'm not sure. Did you and your daughter have an email relationship? Did you ever communicate by email? 
Uh, very rarely. Okay. Um, but you have an email account? Do I have an email account? Yes. Yes, yes I do. And, and did you in 2014? Yes, I did. And you were aware of, uh, of her having an email account as well? Yes. Uh, do you recall uh, communicating with her via email um, sometime, or do you recall after she, uh, after your visit to see the Sullivan house and to pick up some of her property uh, to drive her car, uh, do you recall sending her uh, any emails uh, to that account uh, after that trip in, in November 2014? Yes, I did. And do, do you recall what she specifically wrote to her about what you were discussing? Did I miss her? Do you recall if you if you got into any uh, questions about where she was or how she was doing? I was basically trying. Yeah, I I, I don't even remember the exact words, but I was I was emotionally charged, and I was just if she if I, if there was a chance that she would read those emails, I was sending out a message letting her know that I was missing her and I wanted her to respond. Do you recall being critical of her? Critical of her at all uh, during, in those emails? Objection, relevance. Mm -hmm. Could you clarify for me? Um, yes, sir. Uh, did, you, did you recall telling her in an email that you had that that, that her behavior was 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 bringing you shame? I don't remember typing that. I don't. I don't recall. But with looking at a copy of, of an email that you sent her, a refresh your recollection as it relates to what you told her uh, in November of 2014? I'm sure it would. Professor Deshaun. Isn't This is on base I remember that. Is your recollection refreshed as to uh, your email conversation or the email that you sent to your daughter yes, in I November do. 2014? Yes, I do. I would say I don't say somewhat critical. I would say I exaggerated certain points to try to get her attention. And when you said you were exaggerating certain points, were those points related to her behavior? Yes, even her, the, some of the assertions and accusations I made were exaggerated and not based and founded in fact. That was something I was trying to do that if I felt that she was, were reading that, I could get some kind of reaction out of her so I could get in touch with her. But isn't it true, though, that you did tell her that, that she was, that her behavior, her behavior uh, was bringing you great shame? Attention, relevance. Overall. That was written to someone. The question is whether you sent that message. Oh, yes, I sent the message. I'm sorry. And is it also true that in that message you told her that you uh, didn't know who she was anymore? Objection, hearsay. Overall. Yes, I say that in the message. Is it also true that in that message you indicated to her that, that you thought that she was, her disappearance actually was related to her running around with some pimp doing... Objection, Your Honor. This is hearsay and it's beyond the scope and it's um, completely irrelevant. I don't believe it's being offered for the truth. It's being offered for the effect on the, uh, the listener and also I believe it's purposeful. I 
agree. Did you, did you say that? No, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't make the determination that there's no list when communication is sent out. So is it true that you did in that message uh, indicate by email that you thought your daughter was running around with some pimp? I wrote that in the email, yes. And is it also true that in that email you indicated that you felt that, that you and your mother's efforts, that you and her mother's efforts of a lifetime uh, of sacrifice uh, were just her behavior, which is burning up your efforts and your resources? Objection again here, say your honor. Is there any reason I wrote that in the email, yes. At any point during your conversations with Elizabeth on the 13th of October, uh, did she indicate to you that she'd been sleeping in the park? No. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Can you direct? Yes, please. Good afternoon. Are you okay? Uh, I'm fine. Okay. Put his hand to his chest. That's why I asked him. I'm fine. Okay. Um, I just want to ask you, why did you write those things in the email to Elizabeth? I was in a state of panic. I didn't know where she was, what had happened to her. I just felt in my heart that something was wrong and she was in trouble. And I, I was writing, I wrote that and I exaggerated circumstances. I exaggerated my words, my accusations. Nothing was bounded in fact or, or what I knew. I was doing that to try to get her to respond somehow to me so that I could know she was safe. So you didn't really believe that she was running around with him? Did you believe it? You can answer, sir. No, I did not at all. And did you get a reaction from Elizabeth to this email? Sadly, no. Um, when you wrote that, did you think she was still a missing person? I did. And were you, still, were you hopeful that she would be found or return? I thought she would come back to me. Is this the first time that she's gone missing in your experience? Yeah. You testified that you didn't have any fear for Elizabeth having physical harm by her in-laws moving in. Did you have any other fear for her with her in-laws moving in? I did. What was that? I, I don't even I'm at a loss of kind of how to express it, but the emotional toll that it, I guess would be a way of saying it, the emotional toll that it would take on her to have them come to their home. She was not, she did not want that. And I'm going to ask you a little bit about her trip to Virginia for your mother's, after your mother passed. Yes, ma'am. Um, I believe you testified this morning that that was um, August 22nd, this afternoon. I think maybe you were not totally sure of the date, but it helped you to refresh your memory if you looked at something I showed you related to that. Yes, please. Second, 
do you recall exactly what date Elizabeth flew out to Virginia in response to your mother's passing? That would be August 23rd. She came out the next day. Okay. And do you know if she took an overnight flight? I think she did, yes. So left California on the 22nd and arrived in Virginia on the 23rd? Yes, ma'am. And do you recall exactly what day she left to come back to California? Give me a sec. I'm running. That's fine. I'm guessing August 25th. Are you sure about that date, Mr. Ricks? No, I'm not sure. May I show you something to keep it refreshed your memory? Okay. Just take a look at this document and do that on you. Does that refresh your recollection about the date she left Virginia? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, it's the 27th, and it did help to refresh my memory. So August 27th, she came back to Virginia, or to California from Virginia? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. I want to ask you what, when you came out to California in November of 2014, mm -hmm. um, and visited with the defendant, what was his demeanor like? Was he, well, what was it like? Soft-spoken and distant. Aloof. Was he crying or upset? No. Did he see at wit's end that your daughter was missing? No. I want to follow up with some questions about <coughs> money. You testified on cross that Elizabeth inherited some money when her mother passed. Is that correct? Yes. Um, after she inherited that money, well, first of all, when did she inherit that? Did she get the money in 2012, or was it some later time? If you know. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You said my mother left her. Her okay. mother left her some money, and it was 2014. Thank you. I just okay. understood. Right. So, so, from her mother, she inherited money. Exactly. In 2014? Yes, ma'am. And after she inherited the money, did she ever... No, no, no. We, we, we didn't, we, we, I'm sorry. Her mother left her 50000 which upon her death, which was June of 2012. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you for correcting me. Yes, ma'am. The, the information. After Elizabeth inherited that money, did she ever ask you later for money? No. Was there ever a time you had to help her out financially? The purchase of a car or anything? Yes, right. I did do that when she was in California. So when did that occur? That was just before. I can't recall. I'm getting confused on the dates now. Uh, I'm not certain if it was after her mother's death or before. So let me back this up. Maybe that'll help. My apologies for... It's okay. I'll scramble here. I'm sorry. So her mother passed in 2012, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you said that she inherited the Volvo and some money, correct? Right. And who paid for the car to be shipped to California? You or her? She did. Elizabeth, okay. And then... At some point, in, I think you testified it was April or May of 2014, you talked with her about selling that car to Waldo, correct? Right. All right. And then after that, did you help her out with the purchase of another car? Or did that purchase of the other car happen while she still had Waldo? Right. The 
purchase, the purchase of the Prius was before she had the Volvo. So she had the Volvo and the Prius at the same time? Right. They were allowed. The, the ownership of the And this is the Prius you drove in November? Yes, ma'am. Did, uh, when we, Elizabeth was living with you in Virginia, back when she was younger, mm -hmm. uh, did you notice her to be a saver or a spender of money? Or do you know? Uh, I, think, uh, I would actually say honestly both. Okay. And did she have trouble spending money if she saw something she wanted? No. She'd buy it right away? Yes. And in addition to turning to you for money, um, both to purchase the Prius and to pay the phone bill way back in the early 2000s, uh, did she turn to you for help for other things, financial or otherwise? Yes. Was that something that was common in her life? Yes. And did she ever reach out for you to help her? after October 13th of 2014? No. <coughs> Did that seem unusual to you? Did. Was it unusual for her not to reach out to you? Not to contact you? No, it was, it, it was usual for her to reach out for me. So the fact that she did not was something different for you? Exactly. Relating to, you answered some questions on Cross this morning about Elizabeth using some drugs while she lived in Virginia. Did you ever have to bail her out from an arrest? No. Did you ever have to put her in a drug treatment program? No. Was her drug usage so bad that she couldn't function, or was it just a small part of her life? I would, I would think it was a small part, but like it never affected her ability to function. And thank you, sir. I have no questions. Thank you. Cross examination. All right. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rex, sir, read the record. Could you turn the mic on? Yes, Your Mr. Rex, during redirect examination, you testified that uh, Elizabeth would reach out, was, it was common for her to reach out to you for help. Is that correct? Yes. And that pattern continued um, through October of 2014. Is that correct? Through October 13th of 2013. Is that correct? 2014. Is that correct? Yes. Wait, what was, so what's the final date? 2014, Your Honor. The, the date in question. My apologies. Yes. And it's, is it true that she actually asked you to come out to San Diego uh, to try to help uh, with, with Matthew and with the marriage. Is that true? Yes, she asked me to, to come out and yes, she did. And to, you know, just be a dad, maybe try to exert some influence and try to try to straighten everybody out. Is that true? Yes. And you, uh, you, you actually denied her request. Is that true? Yes. Is it true that you did not come out to help her uh, because at that point in your relationship, you felt that she had misled you too many times. And it's for that reason uh, that you did not feel comfortable moving 3,000 miles to, as you, did, as you would probably put it, in her, uh, to uh, help her fix the situation that she'd made for herself. Does that sound like something you, you would say, you would say to her? I'm not quite sure. Could you ask that one again, please? Yeah. In the course of refusing her request to come out to San Diego, is it true that you told her that part of your rationale for not coming out was that she had deceived you in the past and you did not want to get involved in what might be uh, another, another breach of your trust? I don't know if that's a, exactly a fair assessment. Had she breached your trust in the past? Objection relevance. Elizabeth did ask you to come out, though, in early October 2014, correct? Yes. And you refused her, correct? Right. If 
you believe your daughter was in danger, is it true that she would have come? Action calls for speculation. He testified on <coughs> direct that uh, that Matthew, uh, while he was there, he seemed quiet and aloof. Is that is that correct? Yes. And is it true that in the time that you known him beforehand, he, he had always been kind of a quiet person? Yes. And is it true that he didn't seem like he was the kind of person that would become super emotional? You never saw him in a in a super agitated state in the time that you knew him. In my brief knowledge of him or experiencing him, I would have to agree with that. And he, he, was, he was a relatively soft-spoken person? Bad experience with him, yes. Redirect that you'd uh, never taken your daughter to a drug treatment program. Is that correct? That's correct. Had you ever taken her to a hospital? Objection relevance. Had you ever taken her to a. Uh, had you ever had concern about her psychological well being? Objection relevance. Overall. Uh, can you. I'm not quite sure what, 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 you're, looking, what you're asking me. Did your daughter ever seem depressed to you? I'd have to say no more than I've seen anyone else depressed. She said her, she's a human being with emotions. I see her when I thought she was sad. But the depressed, the clinical, or I mean, I don't know where you're going. Yeah. And, and you're not a doctor, and why not get diagnosed? Thank you, thank you. Of course. But did you ever recommend that she go and get diagnosed? No. Were you aware at any time during that time period that she had been clinically diagnosed? Objection relevance. Sustained to his awareness. Sustained. Did you ever see antidepressant pills around the house when you lived there? No. Did you ever see her taking Adderall? Yes, when she was younger, for as, like school, when she was like in fifth, sixth grade, that kind of thing. Okay, so that was just as a function right. of her, right. her, right, of her elementary school years. Yes, sir. Um, as she progressed into adolescence and early adulthood, uh, did, did you remain the? Did did, did did she rely on you to to help her with her? Well, okay, let me rephrase that. When you saw those, the, 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 the Adderall taking when she was in elementary school, she was a juvenile at that point, correct? Yes. And so getting that treatment was something that was your responsibility as her parent and guardian. Is that true? Correct. And so you, you followed through on that obligation and, and took her to those appointments, filled those prescriptions for her. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And, and by the time she reached early adulthood, 18, 19, 20, she was a grown woman, correct? Yes. And it was no longer your responsibility to be in charge of, of, of seeking her, her, her psychological treatment, correct? Objection, it sort of seeks psychological treatment is too broad compared to the question that precedes it, that's specifically about Adderall. It assumes a fact that it's system. It was no longer your responsibility to, when she was an adult, uh, as it had been when she was in elementary school, to see that she, if she needed Adderall, that she was to get it. Is that correct? Correct. Do you have any knowledge as to why she did not complete her studies at Hampton? Um, not specifically, no, but I know she stopped going to classes. 
and you say she stopped going to classes, I mean, she would, she would enroll, and then she did not have the attendance to keep up with the curriculum? That would be my assumption, she stopped going to classes. Were there times where you thought that she was supposed to be in class and, and she wasn't? Did you personally observe that? No, I didn't. She was, she was a college student, so no, I didn't. And just for clarification, Hampton is, the Hampton University is in Hampton, Virginia? Yes. And she was living at home with you when she was a student there? No, no, she stayed on campus. But to the best of your knowledge, uh, once she stopped going to classes, uh, she never returned back to school, is that correct? Correct. And you never learned the reason uh, why she stopped going to classes? No, I don't know why she stopped going to classes now. Thank you, Your Honor, nothing more. Briefly, uh, Mr. Ricks, how many times uh, had you met the defendant before you came out in November of 2014? No, I had not been until that time. I'm sorry, did you, I think you testified this morning you met him in 2012 when you came out for Christmas? I'm sorry. It's been a long, long day. Right, I met him when I came out for Christmas of 2012. And then after that, did you see him again before you came out in November of 2014 after Elizabeth had been reported missing? Or was that the next time that you saw him? Right, I came out Christmas of 2024. The next time I saw him was when I came out with my niece and Elizabeth had disappeared. So that was the second time you had met him, essentially? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I'm just wondering why, um, when Elizabeth asked you to come out in October of 2014, why you said no. I, from, what I, from what my understanding was, okay, um, I felt like this was something that a young couple should should work out that was between Matt and Elizabeth. And I felt like me coming in, not really knowing Matt at all, not really being involved in the dynamic of their marriage, for me to intervene in such a way, I thought to be inappropriate. And I refused to do so. And did Elizabeth make that request of you on October 13th of 2014, or was this sometime earlier in October? Excuse me, this was sometime earlier. This was fine. Right. So, thank you. No more questions. Uh, just briefly, Your Honor. When she made those requests, did, did she indicate to you, though, that it was your understanding that, that their marriage was, was coming to an end? Made the request to, to come out? Yes, sir. No, I did not get that angle. All right. And were you, is, is it true that you, you were not aware that she was having extramarital affairs at the time? Protection relevance? Uh, I was not aware, no. Do you recall telling police officers that she had a plan with Steve Sutton to, to leave and, and leave her kids with Matt? Yes. Who is Steve Sutton? That was, Steve Sutton was a name that I got after her disappearance in talking to different people that were friends of theirs. So is it your testimony today that you don't recall advising Elizabeth that it would be inappropriate for her and Steve Sutton to leave Matthew with the kids. I didn't know that was Steve Sutton you're talking about. But you did advise Elizabeth not to leave her kids, not to leave with some other man and leave the kids with Matthew. Right. And that was in the context of your September, October 2014 conversations, is that correct?
Yes. And there's no question pending. No, sir. What's wrong? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, as I recall. Yes, sir. Okay. When that was put to me, I did not know Steve Sutton's name then, and that was a conversation we had in my car on the way up to D, on the way up to where my mother, my mother just died, and the way that conversation was phrased to me, yes, sir, I took it to be hypothetical. But certainly, there was a discussion of leaving, of her leaving the family, and leaving Matthew with the kids. Hypothetically speaking, yes. But, but, but that, that, was the, that was the conversation, correct? Hypothetically speaking, yes, that was the conversation. And at that time, you advised her that that would be, that would be an inappropriate move. Yeah. Hypothetically speaking, that would, be, that would be a bad thing to do. You wouldn't want to do anything like that. Yeah, you, you didn't raise a daughter to leave her kids. No. And that wasn't a conversation that you initiated, correct? I don't know. I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I mean, you didn't just out of the blue say to your daughter, hey, you want me to advise you about leaving your husband and along with the kids and going off another man? Honestly, I don't remember how to conversate it. it just, I don't remember how it started. All right, but, but certainly on the drive from Hampton, Virginia to Northern Virginia, uh, that, that was a part of the discussions between you and your daughter, correct? The hypothetical conversation speaking of, yes. But, but, the, but the word, hypothetical or not, those were the words between the two of you, correct? Question asked and answered. Thank you, Nothing further. By October 13th of 2014, yes, ma'am. When you had your last conversation with Elizabeth, and she was talking about getting a restraining order against her husband's family, was she planning to keep her kids? Objection. State of mind, Your Honor. Find a foundation as a her plan. You're asking questions to what she said. So there's been a lot of questions about what her hypothetical plan was back in August, and I'm trying to get what the real plan was in October. All I'm saying is, you're phrasing the question, then, was she planning to do X? You need to phrase the question for it to be admissible. Did she tell you? That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Did Elizabeth tell you what her plans were for her children? on October 13th of 2014. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. So were her kids, um, did, when she told you she wanted to get a restraining order against her husband's family, did she say she was going to get it against the kids too and kick them out of home? No, no. Okay. Did you have any impression that she was going to be separated from her children at that point? No. And at that point, was she talking about running away with Steve Sutton? No. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Any thoughts? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Is there objection to this witness being excused? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. And then, then you are excused. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Calandra Michelle Harris, C A L A N D R A Harris, H A R R I S. Good afternoon, Miss. Good afternoon. Can you tell us um, where you live? I live in Hampton, Virginia. And what do you do for a living in Hampton, Virginia? I'm an office manager at a university. Is that Hampton University? Hampton University. And do you know, um, did you know Elizabeth Sullivan? Yes. How did you know Elizabeth? We met at Hampton University. We were both uh, secretaries in the same building. And when did you meet her? I believe it was 2008 or 9. And did you work in the same office? We did not work in the same office. We worked in the same building. And did you become friends? Yes. Good friends? Very good friends. Best friends. So did you spend a lot of time together with her? Yes. And were you aware that she was at some point dating a man named Matt Sullivan? Yes. Did you meet him while she was dating him? Yes. And approximately how long did they date before they got married? couple months. And were you and Liz roommates or no? No. And do you know how she and Bennett met? I do not know where they met. I do know they lived across the street from one another. And do you recall when they got married? Do you I know don't. The, the date? That's what I'm asking. I'm sorry. I don't recall the date. Okay. Did you attend the wedding? I did not attend the wedding. Was there any sort of celebration afterwards? Yes. Uh, and were you there for that? Yes, I was. And were there many people uh, at this celebration? Maybe 10. And where was it? Her apartment. And do you know, uh, do you know a woman named Kay Taylor? I do not know Kay Taylor. And how long was it um, after they got married that Elizabeth and Matthew moved to San Diego? Uh, maybe two and a half, three months. And did you and she remain friends after she moved out here? Yes. And did you get the chance to visit her while she lived in San Diego? I did not. Did you have plans to come visit her? When were you going to come visit her? Summer 2015. And approximately how often did you communicate with Elizabeth after she moved out here? Every day. Was that by talking or texting or both? Um, we talked, text, and FaceTime.
were you, uh, when is the last time that you got to see Elizabeth in person? Uh, when she came back to Hampton for her grandmother's funeral. And was that in August of 2014? Yes. After that, were you still in communication with her on an almost daily basis? Yes. And I'll ask you, um, other times you were communicating with Elizabeth, did you ever hear defendant Matthew Sullivan in the background? Yes. And like, how often would you hear him in the background? Not very often, every three, maybe four phone calls. And I'm going to focus you specifically on the time period of September and October of 2014. Okay. Um, then you knew Matthew from Virginia, correct? Yes. Right. And what was his demeanor like or his tone of voice like when you had known him in Virginia? Meek, jovial. Is that the type of voice you heard from him when you overheard him on your calls with Elizabeth in September and October of 2014? No. What was different? It's, um, very hostile, very aggressive, very um, immediate. His voice changed. It was very, very aggressive. And did you ever see any arguments that they had over FaceTime? Yes. What did you see and when was it? Um, I don't recall the timeline exactly, but I did see him. I did see him hit her with a burrito. And how did he hit her with a burrito? She said something and he threw it at her, hit her in the back of the head. And you saw this over FaceTime? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, for the court sorry. reporters that we have to say yes. Yes. Do you think that was after her mother or her grandmother had passed? Yes. And over the course of your conversations, with Elizabeth in September and October, when you heard her husband in the background, um, was it only occasionally aggressive and uh, as you described it, or is it more than once? Was it changing in the how frequency of that? No, it was more than once. It was becoming increasingly aggressive and increasingly invasive. What do you mean by invasive? Um, sometimes we would be on the phone and she would be in her private room, but as soon as she opened the door, he was right there. Or he would demand to speak to her while we were speaking right then. And you could hear him doing that? Yes. And what was Elizabeth's um, general tone of voice with you during this time frame when you talked with her? Um, increasingly submissive. She became very quiet. We whispered a lot. A lot of times we had to end our conversations. Why is that? Just get out. Just sure. Get out. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Okay. Why did you have to end your conversations? We would have to end our conversations because Mac was either coming, listening, um, she was afraid he was coming. Did she seem to be afraid of him? Yes. And were you aware of other prior domestic violence between the two of them? Yes, I knew the police had been to the house prior. Did um, you and Elizabeth talk about she and the defendant splitting up or ending their marriage? Yes. And what time frame was it for that you talked with her about that? Um, she started talking about it in the summer, um, but she was really serious. August, September, October, she was very serious. Okay. And from what you could hear of from Matthew in the background of your conversations with her, um, did it seem like he was calmly accepting that situation? Absolutely not. Um, did 
did you know that her in-laws were going to be moving into her residence here in San Diego? Yes. Did Liz talk, was Liz talking to you about that? Yes. And was that something she was happy about? Absolutely not. Um, why was she not happy about that? She did not get along with Mr. Sullivan's mother. Um, they had had some disagreements in the past. She had visited in the past. The visit did not go well or comfortably. And um, Elizabeth, she and Elizabeth did not see eye to eye at all. And did Elizabeth talk with you about uh, what she was going to do to stop that from happening, meaning her mother in law moving in with her? Well, first she told him that she could not, they could not occupy the same space in hopes that, well, you say first, she first she told him that they could not occupy the same space. Then she made plans to go to a hotel with the girls. She made plans to go to a hotel with the girls. Um, but we talked about her divorcing him and her staying in San Diego. And did she um, change her mind about the plan to go to the hotel with the girls? I don't know that she changed her mind. We just weren't sure if she was actually coming. So at some point, did it become clear that her mother-in-law was coming to move in? Yes. Approximately when was that? The days, the days before, um, in October, early October. And once it became clear that that was going to happen, what was Liz's um, feeling about it? She still did not like it. She was not going to stay in the same house with that woman, but she did not see why she needed to be displaced from her home and why the mother couldn't make alternate arrangements for herself. And so did Elizabeth talk to you about a plan to prevent her mother mom from moving in? Yes. And what was that plan that she talked to you about? Well, the plan was that she was going to tell Matthew that she could not stay at that house and that she was not leaving because it was military housing. Then the plan was, if that didn't work and she was still coming, that she was going to go to the hotel with the girls. And from that point, she was going to pack her things, she was going to meet with an attorney, she was going to divorce him and stay in San Diego. And did she ever talk with you about getting a restraining order? I can't remember. That was on the table, but I can't remember whether we had excessive conversation about it. Um, and do you know if she actually had those conversations with Matthew telling him that From our text messages, yes. Was I a party to it? No. And did it appear that that resolved the issue? No. And so did she actually, as far as you know, make any arrangements to leave the house with the girls? She was making arrangements to leave the house with the girls. In what way? Uh, she was going to pack her things. She met with an attorney, so far as I know. She met with an attorney. And she was trying to get, um, she was trying to figure out what her rights were, what she could and couldn't do. And yes, she was going to go to a hotel. Okay. And do you recall, do you know when she went to the attorney? Did she share that with you and ask that? Again, we started talking about it. Um, I can't recall exactly when it was. Did you speak with her on the night of October 13th, 2014? Yes. And about what time did you speak with her that day? About 10 o'clock Eastern time. In the morning or at night? At night. And what was Elizabeth's demeanor like during that conversation? She was frantic and afraid. What was she afraid She of? was whispering. Did she say what she was afraid 
she said that she and Matt had had some kind of disagreement. It was really serious. I'm sorry, one moment. And that she was afraid. And did you give her any advice? I told her to lock herself in her room or her girl's room, have a glass of wine, and we just needed to make it to morning. And, was there and lock herself in her room. I do apologize. What was her response to that? She said, I have my V now. I'm going to lock, I'm going to my room. She said, I have my V now and I'm going to lock myself in my room. I then said, if you feel that seriously about it, if it doesn't get any better, call the police in San Diego. And did she respond to that? She said, hold on a sec. And then she said, gotta go, quietly. I didn't hear from her anymore. And that was your last conversation with Elizabeth? Yes. Called her multiple times. I texted her multiple times. I sent messages on Facebook. Called her dad. Called her friends. contacted her husband later after she was reported missing. Um, approximately when did you call? Maybe a week. And did you just make one attempt to contact him or did you try to keep up making contact as time went on? I made a couple attempts to contact him. I did not have Matt's number. I did make contact with one of Liz's friends who told me that she was reported missing. At that point, I was more vigilant in trying to reach Matt because I was wondering about the girls. And was he receptive to your calls? Um, he took one phone call from me. Just one? And he took one text message from me. And after that, what happened? Unfriended me on Facebook deleted all the posts, stopped talking to me, disconnected. I even offered to, I was worried about the girls. I even offered if they needed anything that I would have stuff delivered from the store to the house just to help out. Had he heard anything? He told me that the girls were seeing a psychiatrist and he was stressed out but they didn't need anything. And was that during the one phone call he took? That was the one text message. And then when you noticed that you had been unfriended on Facebook, did you check to see if he was still friends with Elizabeth on Facebook? I started, yeah, I did go through his friends to see who else he had unfriended. Was it just me specifically? I was trying to figure out the nature of why I was unfriended 
and I noticed that Elizabeth was unfriended. All posts regarding her were removed except for one from a couple of years back when they first got married. Did you notice anything else about his account, Facebook posts that struck you as unusual? Yes. I noticed that he posted that he was in a relationship with Kay Taylor. And when did you see that? Less than 30 days after Liz was missing. And were you ever able to get in touch with him again? No. Elizabeth Briggs Sullivan. Is that about how she looked when you last saw her in August of 2014? Yes. I'm going to ask you to take a look at People's Exhibit 4. I'll hand you a small page. And is that the same picture on the screen as it's in your hands? Yes. Who showed in that picture? Liz and Ryan. <coughs> I now need to show you another exhibit, People's Exhibit 7. You can take a look at this document. <coughs> Tell me if you recognize what this is and if it's the same thing that's on the big screen. Yes. What is that? This is my phone bill. From? From Sprint. It's my mobile phone bill from the, um, the last time I, I spoke with her in October. Of 2014. Of 2014. And there are some highlighted lines on there. What do those show? Oh, other times I spoke with her.
No. You just worked there? Yes. And it was in that capacity that you met Elizabeth Rings? Yes. Uh, you said you were both secretaries? Yes. Did you work in the same department? We worked in the same building. And is and that was the source of your original friendship? Yes. And did your friendship eventually blossom out of Yes. Did they include cocaine? I did not do cocaine. Did you see Liz do cocaine? I did not see Liz do cocaine. To your knowledge, did Elizabeth Sullivan use cocaine? It is not to my knowledge that Elizabeth used cocaine. Do you remember telling police officers that she uh, used cocaine? Did cocaine here and there? No. You don't remember that? No. you know what Adderall is? Yes. What is Adderall? A uh, medication for ADHD. In the time that you knew Elizabeth, she was uh, prescribed Adderall? Yes. And you, you saw her take it? Yes. You were calling, you were called telling police that she used to kite her Adderall? Yes. Can you tell the jury what you mean by the term kiting Adderall? She would take her regular prescription and instead of swallow, instead of swallowing that prescribed dosage, she would crush it up in a small bit of tissue. Uh, make it look like a parachute and then swallow it that way for faster absorption. And when she would, uh, when she would kite her out of all, would that be in those social scenarios that you were discussing earlier? Not always. Sometimes you do it at work? No, not at work. And if not work and not social, where would you see her doing? Can you clarify what you mean by social? Is that any time that I... When you're together, when you're not at work? Socializing, right? So the question again is You would see her hiding the Adderalls in both work scenarios and social scenarios. Where would you see her hiding her Adderall? In her apartment. that she was at one point a student at Hampton University? Yes. And did the time frame that you're describing as meeting her when you guys were both secretaries, is it true that that time period came after her time as a student at Hampton? Yes. She was uh, well into her adulthood at that point? Yes. In her early mid-twenties? Yes. How many times did you meet uh, Matthew Sullivan before uh, he and Elizabeth got married? 